Thank you for listening to The Lawyer's Daughter. This is Jen Carroll, and this podcast does not have any video. I know I'm on YouTube, but that doesn't matter. I really appreciate you listening to the podcast here. Let's go get started. Welcome to Day 54. It's September 13th. You probably wonder what happened to Day 55. I'm going to release that in a minute. <clears throat> I got the worst migraine yesterday. I just thought I was just going to die. Woke up with my eyes all with that petechial hemorrhaging around my eyeballs. It's disgusting. And I was just getting ready to start to do these as video because I also post the podcasts over on YouTube. And I need the Jen Carroll army to go over to the lawyer's daughter on YouTube. It has my lawyer's daughter blue logo thing with the just scales of justice because there's two lawyer's daughters out there now. Anyway, it's so hilarious what's happening over on YouTube. And so I, I do want to try to get to doing videos maybe for the last 50 but um but what's happening over there is that i wrote a i did the podcast a couple of days ago about fear and, and in particular about women and how elon and trump i mean trump said suggested that kamala slept her way into them i can't like i'm so tired of the s a overtones um why am i saying s a the sexual assault overtones and all of this so i posted that also to youtube but what happens on youtube of course because it's a much broader audience and nobody's really listening it's just like this giant screaming place um of of just overstimulation if you ask me but what's happening is that on that on that podcast in particular all trump men there's like maybe two women and it's just going crazy with negative comments and people looking at it which is fine for my virality i, I fine. You want to give me traffic because you're making a video controversial. But the thing is, you dumb Fs. The whole thing is about what you're doing. It's about attacking women. It's about bullying women. And you're literally doing it to me on YouTube. I, I don't care. I, I My daughter helped me understand how to deal with comments because for a while there, especially during the murder, which is quite different, I took comments like they hurt. I don't know why. I get, I, I'm one of those like tough broads with the super gooey middle. I am so freaking such a baby on the inside, which is that now you can know how to own me, right? Uh, you, you can call me fat. I'm used to being called fat. That's like nothing. I don't care about that. But if you try to suggest that I'm in any way mean, I'm going to come for you because I'm not mean. Ugh. Anyway, I don't care if they call me stupid either because I know how much education I have and I know how hard I work on these things. So there, but I would love it if any of you are so inclined, you're sitting there listening and you have your phone in your hand or whatever. If you go over to YouTube to the lawyer's daughter, just like it. You don't have to subscribe. That's not necessary. Although if you have a channel, it doesn't hurt. I would love it if you subscribed. You don't have to look at it there or anything. Just put it in your little subscription bucket. But um, moreover, delight in the craziness because I'm going to go crazy again today. And I, in particular, am trying to provoke people today. Very much so because what I'm going to talk about today is absolutely likely to happen if Trump wins. And this is something that you may or may not have thought about maybe like after that, maybe tonight after the second margarita, that's a little bit about me, but you might start to think like this. And, and it's funny today because I wish I could remember who brought it up. But one of the reporters today um, brought up this exact thing. And I've been wanting to talk about it. I just needed to get through some other stuff. We got to get through the debate and everything. So we're going to talk about this. And then this weekend, I'm going to be talking about, it's going to sound super boring, but I've tried to make it really interesting. I'm going to talk about the federal agencies this weekend and what they do for you that you may not realize. So that sounds really lame, but the thing is, that's what this podcast is about, is trying to bring lame stuff to light so that you appreciate how much democracy actually helps you in your life and helps you live a better life. And it's easy to get caught up in our day-to-day. -day. I mean, yesterday with that migraine, I, I couldn't, I couldn't anything, you guys. I had, I was like in the dark with cold rags on my face. It's a funny how fast you can be disabled in your own life just by something medical like that. And so I want to make sure that everybody, as you're living your busy lives and trying to just cope with what's going on, that you understand some of the depth behind how we are, who we are, and how we are, where we are. Because there's a lot of good in America. It's hard to feel like that sometimes because we're so trained now to just bitch and bitch and bitch. But I, the eternal, ever the optimist, ever the optimist, I will continue to provide you with um, a, a fair warning. That's what's going to happen today. But I'm going to end optimistically because I think we got this. But here we go. So here's how the GOP will replace Trump with J.D. Vance. Yep, that's it right there. 
Imagine this. Trump wins the 2024 election, but soon after the GOP decides that he's more trouble than he's worth. He's ranting and raving and ketchup is no longer enough. He's upgraded to mayonnaise because, you know, it's white. I mean, this isn't a stretch. He's exhausted, right? So could the GOP use the 25th Amendment to remove him and install J.D. Vance as president? Well, it sounds a bit like a political thriller. The idea is not entirely out of the question. Here's a breakdown of how it might happen and how Trump's legal troubles fit into the equation. By now, I hope you have realized that the conservative strategy has been firmly grounded in winning the long game. Let me tell you what this means. So when I'm talking about the conservative strategy, I mean all those folks over there, and it's over there as far as I'm concerned, who have been diabolically planning, most of them white Christian nationals, nationalists, um, have been slowly planning this, this long game. So here's what I mean. Republicans have repeatedly proven their commitment to the long game, often working behind the scenes for years or even decades to reshape American governance. Two organizations at the forefront of this strategy are the Federalist Society. You know them. That's Clarence Thomas's favorite, favorite, favorite group of people. And the Heritage Foundation, both of which have played instrumental roles in con developing conservative legal, political, and social frameworks. Their long-term strategies illustrate their meticulous planning and deep commitment to achieving their goals. Guys, they have, I, I can't, it's hard to get people to understand this, especially if you're not a white man, but they have the most to lose. Their power, their, their, the way they use money, how they've been managing to control the vote, how they're still using the Electoral College to underrepresent um, or overrepresent is probably the better way to say it. We'll say it in the in the in the positive. Overrepresent conservatives in our democracy by gerrymandering districts, by deciding people can come off the voting rolls because they have people in power who just do this. It is a long game. So here's how long it's been. The Heritage Foundation has been pulling the strings for nearly 50 years. It played a critical role in shaping conservative policy across multiple administrations. It began in the Reagan era when it provided a detailed set of policy recommendations known as the Mandate for Leadership. This guide was the blueprint for much of Reagan's, Reagan's conservative agenda, including economic policies like deregulation and tax cuts. Fast forward to today. In fact, the, the blog that I didn't get out yesterday that will be coming out day 56, right? Day 55 is going to talk a bit about deregulation during the Reagan era and how that's led us to our nightmare today. That's going to be posted out of order, but it's still the it's still the day before this one. So if you want to hear it, it'll go up after this. This guide, I'm sorry, this guide uh, was the conservative agenda during Reagan, including policies like deregulation and tax cuts. And today it's still called a mandate for leadership that follows this tradition by preparing the next conservative president with even more detailed recommendations. So they've had an actual book, guys. You saw it at the convention. They've the these this conservative agenda has created media echo chambers to amplify their message. So the conservative media ecosystem, often supported by think tanks like the Heritage Foundation, have shaped public opinion. This is so, guys. This has been researched to death. Channels like Fox News, OAN, Newsmax, Epic Times, and social media platforms like X. Truth Social, Rumble, and Telegraph, the one I can never remember the name of, amplify conservative values and create a feedback loop that energizes the base and focuses on long-term goals. This is the thing. It's such an echo chamber. That's when Trump said during the debate, I saw it on TV as if TV is somehow a legitimate source. Oh my God. TV is to make you think and then go read more about it. That's what TV is supposed to do. Ugh these days. Anyway, creating a media feedback loop that's energizing these guys and the alignment between the media, legal, and political strategies ensures that conservative movements maintain momentum, even in the face of setbacks. Fox News was found guilty of skewing the news and paid a sizable fine, and yet they still do it. That's why Trump was confused during the debate. He watched the crap on Fox News where they exaggerate, exacerbate, and otherwise racist ties, race, racist ties. I just made up a word. 
turned everything into a racist context. Here's another way that they've been the long game. Mitch McConnell has successfully packed the courts with Federalist Society members. The long-term efforts to pack the courts with conser conservative judges is foundational to their strategy. Why? Because in conservative de judges dominating the judiciary means they'll create an environment where laws on issues like gun control, health care, and voting rights will be interpreted through a conservative lens. And that's just that we're not even to regulations and all this other stuff, guys. That's just the basics. They want judges who are going to turn their heads away and just say privatize, privatize, privatize. This guarantees the conservative party long term influence as federal judges serve for life. Judiciary is becoming a tool for implementing conservative values long after a president leaves. Long game. Get it? Long game. They're doing it. They overturned Roe v. Wade while Biden was president because that's how it works. That Supreme Court is the frickin' third rail. That is an incredibly important branch of our government and it's corrupt AF right now. Not all of them, but three of them for sure, maybe more, probably five. Yeah, I got to, I'm back up to the Jen Carroll holy crap voice. I hate when I do that. Let me bring it back down. Sorry, that's got to be hard on your ears. I shouldn't do that. <clears throat> they worked for decades to get Roe v. Wade overturned. It wasn't an overnight victory. The Federal Society spent decades grooming and promoting judges who would reinterpret the Constitution through a conservative lens. They created a pipeline of legal professionals. And this is really important because you need to know who the judges, the Supreme Court judges, pick as their assistants, they have a name, I forgot, associates, the people who, clerk, sorry, that's it, clerk for them. Those also go on to undermine our democracy. That's, that's you look and you find out who's clerk for the clue. This is such an insular club and it really, really, really does get super powered by the Federalist Society. So you need to look at that if you're interested in the judiciary. Anyway, in 2016, Donald got to was provided a rare opportunity. <laughs> yeah, he was provided the rare opportunity because Mitch McConnell would not put forth Obama's nomination for the Supreme Court because Mitch McConnell is a freaking sellout and a piece of human garbage. Tell us how you really feel, Jen. So anyway, he he was able to select three support Supreme Court justices, and we need to be clear about select. The Federalist Society had them for him. He just had to take them. He doesn't you need to understand how much of a figurehead is Donald is. I think anybody listening to this understands he's a figurehead. But if there's ways we you can take this information to talk to people who are legitimately on the fence, I wouldn't even waste my time anymore on the people that aren't going to move. They're just, they're lost. They're lost. I don't know what to say. But people who might care, who are really on the fence, this is good information for them. The, the Federal Society influences reaches beyond the Supreme Court. The organization has already actively worked to place conservative judges throughout the judiciary. In fact, that was what Mitch McConnell was doing during Trump's administration. They were banging out judges. And I'll have you know, the Democrats are doing the same thing right now. We are banging out judges. In fact, I think Schumer just said, that's what we're gonna do. So we've got a few more months to go. Let's just get a bunch of judges appointed. Good on them, good on them. I just want judges who can think and not, and not adhere to an ideology that comes before our constitution and our laws. You can have beliefs. Everybody has a belief system. That's fine. But that's not your job when you get to be in the Supreme Court is to bring your belief system. You're supposed to bring your brain. Your brain. Yeah. Okay. So another reason you can tell that the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation have been working on this in the long game is they've been they spent years writing Project 2025. And it's so important because they're trying to manifest I'm going to say it, a white America, at least a white powered America. It is the most ambitious project that the Heritage Foundation has done. It's a thousand page blueprint for restructuring the government. And we've talked about it a lot. It includes dismantling agencies. That's why we're going to talk about agencies this weekend, including the Department of Education, reversing environmental protections and installing political appointees across the federal bureaucracy to ensure alignment with conservative values. That's why we're spending the weekend talking about the government agencies and what they do for you that you may not realize because all of them are in danger. What makes particular project 2025 particularly striking is its scale and foresight. I told you they've been working on this forever. Heritage is currently vetting and training thousands of potential political appointees 
to be ready to step into roles from day one. We are going to do a discussion about the people at the top that are going to help them with this. There are names that are going to make you vomit. So we'll do that in an upcoming podcast. But I want you to know they've already been taking job applications and screening people. And they're doing a, a um, they're doing a values and politics screening as well to make sure that you're going to stand by their plan. So I'm going to guess who's getting hired based on skin color. I'm just going to guess. It's just going to be wild. I'm also going to base it on gender, although maybe it won't be as bad. But I'm going to guess they're white, probably men, because part of the Heritage Foundation people believe that you should only have one vote per family. And if you are an unmarried woman, as I am, I would have to vote the way my father votes. If you are an unmarried woman without a father, as I am, I would have to vote the way my brother votes. And I don't know which brother they'd pick, but that's who I fall under. That's how the hierarchy works when you are a woman. You don't have agency. You have you belong to someone else who has agency. And that person that has the agency has to be a man. So there you go. Okay, so they're hiring these people, political appointees, to be ready to step into these roles on day one. This is not just a reactive approach. This is an intensely proactive, decades-long commitment to changing how the federal government works. In their long game, does installing J.D. Vance as president be part of it? Could that possibly be part of their long game? Installing J.D. Vance after President Trump wins? They demonstrate their long-term term strategy is to consolidate conservative power at every level of government. They could use the 25th Amendment to replace Trump with J.D. Vance. It's possible. While Trump has served as a useful figurehead, his erratic behavior may no longer align with, this, with the organization's carefully curated vision. <laughs> That's the funniest sentence I ever wrote. His erratic behavior may no longer align. I mean, let's face it. Trump has already waffled on abortion. He's he's waffling on other things because he's finding out they're not popular. He waffled so hard today that his campaign made a Trump heiress shirt based on what Taylor Swift's eras, eras, sorry, I should say eras, based on Taylor Swift's eras shirt. I'm so serious. I think I'm going to use it, it for today's blog. It's ridiculous. Okay, so anyway, or maybe I'll use it for a different day because I need to put a picture of JD Vance on this one for my photo. Um, so you need to know, this is the point. Well, Trump's been useful, actually a useful idiot, right? Also for Putin, his erratic behavior may not align. Installing someone like Vance, who is deeply connected to these long-term goals, could ensure their vision for America and governance continues. See what I mean? Like, it's like they brought the perfect person to the party and they got Trump to take him. Of course, it came, he came, Vance came with money. That's how they got Trump to take him because Trump needs money. He's got a lot of legal troubles. Anyway, this might seem like a wild hypothesis, but their history of planning and knowing what's going to happen next suggests that nothing should be off their table. Their goal is not just to win the next election. It's to reshape America for generations. So this is not, I mean, we've watched a man have what I'm going to now conclude was a sickening assassination attempt that was in some way faked although two people died which makes me even more sick but trump doesn't care i mean we know he'll run over anything on his way to where he's going he doesn't care that thump thump under the tires doesn't matter to him so let's talk about this 20 but fifth amendment and how this could possibly work the 25th amendment was introduced to handle situations where a president cannot perform the office's duties so in this case, the uh, relevant part here is section four, which allows the vice president, and I'm, uh, listen to this, it allows the vice president, huh, who would the, oh, JD, and a majority of the cabinet, oh, wait, who's in the cabinet? Oh, yeah, the Heritage Foundation put the people in the cabinet for Trump. Trump doesn't know who he wants. Believe, you need to know, I want to use this, believe me, believe me when I say Trump doesn't know who he, he doesn't care. He's too narcissistic to care who's going to be around him, right? As long as other people tell him he, it makes him look good, that's all he cares about. 
he cares about who they are relative to how it makes him look. So his cabinet's going to be staffed by the Heritage Foundation. I just read to you that they're hiring now. They're looking at resumes and you know they have people in charge. And I'm just going to say one name and you just be grossed out when I say it. Stephen Miller. There you go. Stephen Miller. That's the kind of people they're looking at. So here we are looking at the 25th Amendment and the vice president and the majority of the cabinet get to declare the president unfit. If they do that, the vice president immediately becomes acting president. Here's how it works. The vice president and more than half the cabinet sign a statement declaring the president unable to fulfill their duties. I feel like that's cake. That is easy. They can do that. They probably already have it filled out. This place is, they're so busy planning. It's probably, the document's probably already drafted. The vice president then takes over as acting president immediately. If the president contests the declaration, which of course we know Trump would do, Congress has 21 days to decide and it only takes a two-thirds vote in the House and the Senate to remove the president permanently. The public has no direct role in this process, which is entirely in, in the hands of the vice president, the cabinet, and the Congress. So just be, be clear, it doesn't matter how you voted at that point because you voted for both of them. But one of them was a Trojan horse. J.D. Vance is a pro-Trump. J.D. Vance is pro-Heritage Foundation. J.D. Vance is pro-white man. J.D. Vance is pro-family. J.D. Vance is anti-woman. These are all the things that make him so much more committed to this agenda than his commitment to Trump. I would argue none of these very decent, very law-abiding, very good men are really fans of Trump. He's disgusting. But they're doing the long game. And sometimes you'll take somebody gross if that's going to get you where you want to go, right? That's that's just how nefarious the plan is. They're willing to accept anything mediocre if it's going to get them to their end game. So let me tell you, if you're sitting there going, ah, yeah, yeah, I don't think J.D. Vance is the guy. Let me just run through a few reasons why he is. J.D. Vance is Project 2025's calculated um, choice because he is deeply entwined with the project. He wrote the introduction to the Project 2025 plan. His role is more than a passive endorsement. He has actively contributed to the ideological framework, meaning the whole, how it's going to work, all the ideas in there, and the rhetoric behind the project, serving as a bridge between Trumpism, get this, sir, this is so important. He's been serving as a bridge between Trumpism and the Heritage Foundation's ultra-conservative goals. And if you go look at the coverage, he's absolutely been doing this. In fact, this horrific nonsense in Ohio is really the Heritage Foundation's ultra-conservative goals. They want to get immigrants out of everywhere. I don't know where the immigrants are supposed to go. These are all legal immigrants. They got here legally. They they need to they get they get to live their lives they get a chance to survive and yet schools are closed today for bomb threats in tiny springfield ohio because vance actively contributed to the ideological framework and rhetoric behind heritage foundation and trumpism he's serving as a bridge and he activated racism jd's long and deep ties to project 2025 dates back to the introduction of a Heritage Foundation report in 2017. And that's about when JD started really showing up, right? He showed up a little bit earlier, but he started to kind of get in the, he, he figured out how to make noise, right? The report promoted a highly conservative agenda, which included extreme positions on banning abortion, criticizing fertility treatments like IVF, because what are you going to do with all those embryos? And this has become a component of the broader vision that product, Project 2025 aims to implement. And he has cemented his ties to its architects. His role extends to more recent activities. He wrote the foreword to a book by, by Kevin Roberts, who was president of the Heritage Foundation and one of the leading figures behind it. The book, the book was supposed to come out right now, but they actually are holding it because they, the blowback from Project 2025 has been so strong. He's holding on the book. But Roberts calls what the plan is, is a second American revolution prom promoting dismantling core federal institutions like the DOJ and Department of Education and Vance is aligned with him. And then finally, Vance, <laughs> here we go. The project is, is so committed to, the, to rewriting the federal government. Vance has been a supporter of these ideas 
Vance has long been a supporter of firing large segments of the federal workforce, reducing the influence of independent agencies, banning woke propaganda in schools, curtailing reproductive rights, and making abortion unthinkable in the U.S. That's part of his deal. And his rhetoric aligns perfectly with the Heritage Foundation's vision of a traditional controlled society. Get that controlled society, which is so creepy, where conservative norms rigidly defied family and gender roles. So back to like, if you're a woman, you belong to a man. You just have to figure out which man you belong to. But apparently there's some sort of table. So they can put find you on the table and tell you what man you belong to, depending on your level of, I don't know what happens if you're a divorced woman. Do you, re, do you revert to your father and your brothers? Or do you stay on as a, as a divorced, like, like, do you become one of your ex-husband's? I don't know how that works. Do you maybe report to your son? I don't know. I need to see the table. Uh, and so they believe Vance is the ideal successor. They want someone who can carry out their goals without the chaos that Trump often brings. Vance's combination of populism, cultural conservatism, and deep connections to heritage make him the perfect figure. The fact that Vance is already integrated into their strategy only strengthens the possibility. Vance's ability to navigate between the extreme conservatism of the Heritage Foundation and his public persona as an outsider politician makes him a valuable asset. Project 2025, with its broad and aggressive agenda, needs someone like Vance who can publicly just support the dismantling of federal agencies while maintaining a connection with Trump's base. His political future appears to be tied to the success of the project and its overarching vision for reshaping America. Vance's extensive connections to the Heritage Foundation and Project 2025 also suggests he's not merely a bystander in this movement. He's an active player, contributing to the ideological practical framework of, what in modern, of one of modern politics' most ambitious conservative agendas. If Trump is sidelined or removed from office, Vance could easily step in as the figurehead for this movement, leading the charge to implement the 2025 far-right vision for America. And while Trump may have started as the face of the movement, his unpredictability could make him a liability. In contrast, Vance's deep connection to the Heritage Foundation make him stable and manageable, someone who can carry out the conservative agenda. And they just may have the opportunity sooner and more easily than anyone imagined. Because guess what? J.D. Vance is going to step in when Trump is jailed. Trump still faces four major criminal cases, potentially destabilizing the president if he's the winner. If he wins the presidency, this will totally be a problem. He still has the classified documents case. Those are the allegations of mishandling the sensitive documents that he stored in the bathroom at Maragago. Maralago. 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 You know, the Southern White House. He also has Georgia election interference where he faces racketeering charges in Georgia for trying to overturn the 2020 election. That carries a maximum sentence of 20 years. He has the Stormy Daniels hush money case where he was already found guilty of falsifying business records related to a payment to keep the adult film actress quiet about the affair so he could win the 2020, 2016 election. Oh, these go back. And then, of course, the January 6th conspiracy where Trump is charged with trying to defraud the U.S. and obstruct an official proceeding related to the 2020 election. It's just keep on coming. If Trump's sentenced to jail while in office, it's going to trigger an unprecedented, there's that word again, legal and political challenge and the 25th Amendment could be called into play. So thanks for the conspiracy, Jen. Could this really happen? Well, here's the deal. Conservative leadership can come for Trump on two sides. One is the declaring he's batshit crazy and putting him out, kind of what I talked about at the beginning of this. It's likely to have blowback among his supporters and it could get messy. I don't think it's their first choice, to be perfectly honest. But him being sentenced for a crime is a much easier path. Uh, they just have to, they, they're going to suddenly do their constitution speak, right? And figure out how to talk about how it's unconstitutional to have a a jailed president because it's not unconstitutional to have a criminal running for office but if he actually ends up incarcerated uh oh that's crossing the line if that happens all that has to happen is the republicans have to agree 
that J or I'm sorry, J.D. Vance has to agree that Trump's unfit and the, and he needs um, most of the cabinet to agree. Not a problem because their mission is much bigger than Trump. In fact, they're probably happy to get him out of the way. It needs congressional approval if Trump contests. Remember, if Trump says, no, 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 you can't do this to me. Congress has to do it. Two thirds majority in both chambers. That will be interesting because I believe that the conservatives would do it. But the problem is the Democrats are unlikely to support this because in a lot of ways, Vance is actually more dangerous. If you can imagine a world where somebody's more dangerous than Trump, yeah, it's probably J.D. Vance. So here's the deal, people. We need to spread the word and remind Dems to get out and vote. We've got to go out and tell our friends that there's more at stake here than they even thought. And the reason it's important is two reasons. One, it validates the choices you're already making. Good for you. Um, we want this. We want to make sure Democrats know what we're fighting for and that we are fighting for the right things. And anytime that gets validated, it's up, upside. But we also want to make sure folks understand the stakes are higher than they might understand. If I hear one more person talk about the price of their groceries, I'm going to just bop them on the head like little bunny frou-frou because your price of your groceries is just not something the president sits there and worries about like that. They worry about much bigger things. Like if you can even get food, that's what presidents are worrying about. What happens if we have more climate disasters and you can't even get food? You want to tell me what's going to happen to the price of your groceries? You got to think this through people. You got to think it through. The ugly truth is Trump's probably going to die once he gets in office. And so this could happen regardless. It won't even take all this special work. That man looks like he's an aneurysm waiting to happen. And I know aneurysms. That's how my mom died. This man is a mess. So what I'm going to tell you is we know we are not going back. We know when we fight, we win. And we know that Kamala has captured the imagination of healthy Americans and shown them that we can turn this country around and head in the right direction. And it's been a while and I'm up for it. So guys, no going back, people. Let's go forward. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Make sure you subscribe and rate, and I'll be back with another episode really soon.